Okay, praise God. Well, God, we pray that you would bless your word to us, Lord. Strengthening us in your word, in your truth, penetrating our hearts. Please open our minds, our hearts, our eyes, and our ears to hear your voice, to know the presence of your Holy Spirit and that you would bear much fruit in and through our lives, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. When we say grace at, at mealtime, Victoria likes to hit the table nice and hard when we say amen. 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 <laughs> She's a future preacher. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> Grace, Victoria Grace. So it's victorious grace. <laughs> Praise God. Well, um, I want to talk about, uh, just for a little while, the subject of wisdom, God's wisdom. And uh, the other day I was just uh, uh, contemplating some scripture and um, and thinking of people that are, um, especially gifted and with intelligence, and I, I think all of us can recognize those people and um, recognize them and appreciate the gifting that God gives to people. I think of Albert Einstein. I always tell people he died the same year I was born, so I took over his mantle, but nobody really <laughs> buys into that. But anyways, um, he was uh, an extraordinarily gifted man, and as I, as I like to read um, different uh, reformers and Puritans or just listening to different preachers and can really appreciate the uh, intelligence that God has given in some men. I think of a Joel Beakey, for example, who has accomplished so much in, in his lifetime and others, uh, some of the reformers like um, Heinrich Bullinger and John Calvin, uh, Martin Luther, Theodore Beza, and so many of the others, Zwingli, and, um, and also many of the Puritans as well that were uh, very gifted. And, and, um, and then coming back to thinking of um, Spurgeon as well, he, he had to have been really gifted intellectually because he had almost a photographic memory. He, they didn't use that language, but um, the amount of reading that guy did in, in all the work of ministry, in fact, I, I'm convinced that the reason he died, in fact, that's what his biographers say, that uh, at such a young age as he, he was overworked. Even when he was in his mid-20s, his wife said he was already burning out. I mean, he was just, the demand on him was so profound. But in the process of that, he had a library of something like 30,000 volumes. I don't think he read them all. Um, <laughs> I doubt that very much. He um, read all of Matthew Henry's commentary straight through, and that's six volumes, if you can imagine that. He read uh, Pilgrim's Progress about 100 times in his lifetime. And so, you know, definitely, uh, and, and a skill with words that's just outdone by few. Um, and so, you know, it's a gift that God gives him, but as I'm thinking about that, um, I'm also thinking that that's, this wasn't the key to his success in ministry, nor was it to anybody else's. He admits very much so that Charles Spurgeon says that um, it's, it is totally the Spirit of God. He said, if, if my people at my church didn't pray for me, I'd quit preaching today. He said, because I ab desperately, desperately need the Holy Spirit. Sometimes before going out to preach, he would even be weeping and begging people to pray for him before going out there. Um, and... Uh, I do like the story of how at one point he went to a church in another town just to take a time of respite, sitting in the back of the church wondering if God had actually called him to the ministry or not. He struggled with sicknesses and disease and, uh, and so on. And uh, so anyways, it's the, it's, it's the Holy Spirit we depend on. But as I'm thinking about that, the thought comes into my mind that, you know, intelligence is not wisdom, okay? Intelligence is not what the Bible means by the word wisdom. Neither is um, knowledge, um, having a lot of knowledge, degrees or college education or whatever, 
wisdom. I mean, that, that, it's, a, it's, it's good to have, um, it's good to have that, that intellect. God gives many people. It's good to have knowledge, to be educated. And, um, but it's, um, it's not the same as what the Bible's calling as wisdom. Great rhetorical skills, the ability to speak, not necessarily indications of wisdom. Somebody may be sharp with words, but not necessarily having the wisdom of God. I think all, maybe we all have desired at some point to have truly God's wisdom in our lives. All you have to do is turn on the television and listen to, pe listen to people in Washington, and you can see what it's like not to have wisdom. <laughs> so anyways, um, but, you know, godly wisdom is, is, uh, is really a gift. And as the Proverbs says, it comes from the very mouth of God. Proverbs chapter 3 will mention that. In particular, uh, the beginning of Proverbs in the introduction to Proverbs, you don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read like two verses out of there if you can, if you want to. But um, in one seven it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools, that's ignorant fools in this, this case, despise wisdom and instruction. They despise wisdom and instruction. And the clearer word that in quote that we've often heard is in chapter 9, verse 10. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Um, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight or understanding. The knowledge of the Holy One, that's what insight is. That's what true understanding is. And interestingly, in his high priestly prayer, Jesus Christ said, and this is life eternal, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is a verse worth memorizing for you, worth underlining. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight, is understanding. And um, we see in first, um, excuse me, in Colossians, first of all, I'm going to go there for a moment. Something we see here about, about wisdom. Book of Colossians chapter 2. Just the first couple of verses, first four verses. The Apostle Paul is talking to these Colossian believers, um, these churches in Colossae, that um, have been very much influenced by some heretical movements and, so, and that, that Greek culture, which put a lot of emphasis on knowledge. But the, the false teaching that was predominant was an incipient um, Gnosticism, kind of a Gnosticism that was just developing, that taught the, uh, that there are such things as secret knowledge, and that secret knowledge is the key to life. And um, only the, quote, the enlightened ones have that secret knowledge. And he's trying to get them focused not on what the world offers as wisdom, not what the world is offering as the key to life. And we live in a day, and you just go to a bookstore or library to the special help sections, and everybody's got the key to being happy or successful or, or prosperous. They say they do, and they write books about it. But Paul is trying to stir the people back here away from the thinking, the way of thinking that the world has. He says in verse 1, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches. Look at that language that the Apostle Paul uses. That they may <clears throat> they reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding in the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Verse 4, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments or persuasive. Another translation of legacy says the persuasive arguments. I don't want you to be deluded. 
I don't want you to, Paul, Paul is saying, I don't want you to be led astray or deceived by philosophers. I, I don't want you to be led astray by, by what even sounds like very plausible, very persuasive arguments. Always go back to the word of God and to the wisdom that God must give. It does remind me of the revelation that God gave the apostle Peter when um, he said, who do people say that I, the son of man, am? And they all, the disciples would say, well, some say you're Elijah, some say you're Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And, uh, but he said, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to Peter, um, you know, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. But my father who's in heaven, he's revealed this to you. So you're blessed. You're blessed, Simon Barjona, because you received a revelation from God as to who I am. And people can learn about Jesus. They can learn all the wrong stuff by reading Time magazine or all those other magazines around Easter time, Christmas time. Um, but really to know Christ is, can be done through and by his Holy Spirit and through his word. In Proverbs, a wisdom book in our Bibles, not just the only one, we have several wisdom books, books that are categorized in that area, including the book of Psalms, is, is wisdom literature. Um, make it very clear that this wisdom comes from God. True knowledge is God. Jesus Christ came to reveal God to people. Life eternal is to know God. Paul says that I might know him in the power of his resurrection and have a fellowship in his sufferings being conformed to his death. So he wanted to grow in the knowledge of God. Peter closes his second epistle by saying, by saying that you could be growing in the knowledge of Christ. So look at this wonderful language to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding, to truly, truly have understanding that comes from God's revealed truth by the Holy Spirit. You can't separate them. Some people will say, well, I have the Holy Spirit. I don't need anybody to teach me anything. Well, actually you do. God has placed teachers in the church, and, um, but only, only as they teach the truths of God's word. And that, that's, I don't know about you guys, but I, I don't, I've, I've heard many sermons, I just don't like them, where you, you just know the preacher decided to pull some kind of a topic together and just sprinkle it with a verse or two that really has so little to do with the subject, you know? God wants us to get his message in the word. Af after all, he's the author, isn't he? Uh, he he used human authors, but he inspired them. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. The Bible is all God-breathed. So it's coming from the mind and heart of God. So I want what God wants to reveal to me in his word. And that's what preaching should really be. It should be all about what God is wanting to reveal. And so the tremendous riches, people, that are available to us um, in the knowledge of Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I love that language that the Holy Spirit inspired. Treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, there's no secret um, method to, to gaining that. All I can say is, you know, well, what do, what do we do about that? What's practical? What can I do? Well, pray. <laughs> I don't know what else to do. Paul prays in Ephesians and um, chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, he's, he's praying for the believers that they would have a spirit of revelation and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And um, <clears throat> going back there just for a second, in, um, in chapter 1, verse 17, it says uh, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him having the eyes of your hearts enlightened so that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. We need to be enlightened. We need to have, to have God reveal Christ to us. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of God, and the spirit of revelation in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. If Paul was praying these things, he knew well enough. Experientially, he knew this 
that God has to reveal it. So there's no, there are no human methods to reaching that goal. There's only God to turn to. To his word, God has given us many godly teachers, and we live at a time when there are many good books out there. We have to be discreet, but um, there, there are many good books. A, a quote from Spurgeon on that, because he did have a large library, he said, visit many good books, but live in the Bible. I think that's a good way to put it. Visit many good books, but live in the Bible. We're heading to 1 Corinthians now, so you can... Just, just go there, chapter 1 in 1 Corinthians. But um, Ephesians is, is a pray, great place to go when you're praying. Well, how do I pray? Well, I would pray what Paul prayed for you, <laughs> um, that God would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, oh, you live in me, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Open up these treasures of wisdom and knowledge that are in you, my Savior, my Lord. First Corinthians is um, probably one of the more remarkable areas that is showing us the difference between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom that comes from God. In First Corinthians, we're going to begin <clears throat> with verse 17. Paul had just been dealing with these Corinthian believers about their divisions. You know, I, I was baptized by Paul. I was baptized by Cephas or, or whatever. I, I follow Christ. I follow Cephas. I follow Paul or I follow Apollos. There were these divisions. You see, one of the problems with Corinth, you know where Corinth was, it's right in the heart of Greece. I mean, it's right where the Greek culture was strong and not that far from Athens. And, and they took a lot, a lot of pride in philosophy and rhetoric and debate, skilled knowledge, and took great pride in that. And Paul is trying to say the gospel can never, ever be about man's intellect. It cannot be about philosophy. It can never be about my skill in having depths of knowledge. It, if I'm a walking encyclopedia, good for me. That's not what is to shape our gospel message. Unfortunately, throughout the years, uh, the history of the church, many have done that. It was the great, um, it was the great early church father, Tertullian, who said, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? <laughs> Rebuking many of the teachers of his time who wanted to look acceptable and smart to other philosophers. So they philosophized so much of their message in Christianity. And that, and that was, Tertullian was saying, that's, that's a problem. We don't have to appear smart to philosophers. We need to preach the gospel. What does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? You know, let's just preach the gospel of our Savior. And uh, that's what Paul is drumming home here to the Corinthians. That's why there were divisions. They took great pride in who was the wiser one. And they oftentimes looked at Paul and despised him because he came across as a weak man from the many beatings he suffered. And plus, he didn't pull out of his think tank all the things he could have because he was a very educated man and a very brilliant man. But he didn't rely on that. And, <clears throat> and that's what we'll read here. Starting with verse 17, Paul says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. You get that? That's a good one to memorize too and to underline. Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Think about that. If you want to impress somebody with your preaching, well, you won't have the power. I just read an entire message, as this one book I have of sermons that Charles Spurgeon preached at different conferences for ministers. And at one, at one of them he gave when he was much older, toward the end of his life, 
And he was in, at the time, very sick and, and in a lot of pain. And he starts, he starts his message, his conference message to these pastors and students. He starts it out by saying, I will be bring, I'll be bringing my message today with tears and in much pain. And I'm sorry if, if I'm going to be unable to communicate as effectively as I would like to be able to communicate. Well, it was an incredible sermon. I, I got it in print. I read it. It's wonderful. But anyways, um, that was his whole point. Don't try to be polished preachers. You know, don't try to come across as someone who has eloquent wisdom. Don't be worrying about quoting a group of authors to show that you've got knowledge. He said, preach the gospel. Preach the word of God. It's, um, don't let pride creep in there. You don't have to impress the people. Paul goes on to say in verse 18, for the word of the cross is folly, is foolishness to those who are perishing. When I read that in preparation for today, I was thinking, what is our experience going to be when we preach the gospel to other people, when we share the gospel with others? Well, the Holy Spirit will work on some and open their eyes. Maybe now or maybe later, but God will, God's word will accomplish its purpose. On the other hand, there will be those who reject the gospel. We see that very clearly throughout Scripture. And I think of Thessalonians alone and concerning the Antichrist, that God will send them a strong delusion, a spirit of delusion. Why? Because they didn't have a love of the truth. They rejected the truth. And, you know, people can either receive or reject the truth. Well, here, the message of the cross is foolishness to who? Those who are perishing. Now, hopefully, many of those who it's foolishness to will eventually come to see its wisdom. And, um, and I've certainly heard many testimonies of those who would come to mock at different churches or tent meetings with D.L. Moody and others and would hear the gospel and just be blown away by it and come repent and come to faith in Christ. But it will be foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. The gospel is the power of God. It's going to come across foolish to the world, but let it come across foolish. Don't be surprised by those who make mockery. And they're going to, because to the, to the perishing world, to those living in darkness and under Satan's sway, they're going to see this as foolishness. But really, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to all those who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, it says in Romans chapter 1. It says in verse 19, for it is written, and quoting the Old Testament scripture, for I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning, I will thwart. Verse 20, where is the one who is wise? Meaning, where is the one who thinks he's truly wise? Where is the scribe or the scholar, you could say there? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? How did God make foolish the wisdom of the world? Well, one thing we know for sure, that no matter how many philosophers there have been, no matter how many trillions of books have been written, nobody has ever come to know God through their own minds, through their own philosophies. It, 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 they, if, you, if you study philosophy at all, and I've only studied it like maybe that much, <laughs> but enough to be aware of the different philosophers and what their ideas were, their main ideas, that is. It's all, it's all about wanting to find out the truth about existence. Why do we exist? Do we really exist? I think it was David Hume who thought, I think it was David Hume who said, I think, therefore I am. Um, but anyways, different, um, they, tr they try to find... Is, is there really a phenomenal world? Uh, or, no, there is a phenomenal world, that which we can see and touch, but is there a nominal world, that a spiritual world? What, what's out there, you know? And, um, but in the wisdom of God, nobody has ever been able to find God. So no matter how much the scientists look through their telescopes, they're not going to see God. <laughs> God. God in his wisdom has, um, has made it so that all of the world's wisdom looks foolish. In fact, verse 21 says this, for since 
in the wisdom of God. The world did not know God through wisdom. Got it? In the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Literally in the Greek, it does not say through what we preach, though many of our translations say that. In the Greek, it says um, that God um, is through the folly of preaching itself. So the means that God uses to save is preaching, and it's the preaching of the gospel. It's not going to be through gimmicks. It's going to be through a proclamation of the gospel. And that includes, of course, the message preached because we're preaching Christ crucified and raised again. So I, this is one verse I have always loved and appreciated, that in the wisdom of God himself, this is God's infinite wisdom, the world did not know God through wisdom, meaning its own wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of preaching or what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek for wisdom. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness or folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, the proclamation of the person of Christ. That's the wisdom of God. One of the big things that happened in the liberal, higher critical movement that came in throughout Europe and then into the United States, especially in the late 1800s, early 1900s, they said, we have to make some adjustments in, adjustments in what Christianity is if we're going to reach our world. And so the gospel turned away from the, the traditional um, idea of a, of a bloody atoning cross and started becoming a social movement. If we're going to reach the world, we need to be, come across as a movement that wants the betterment of mankind. We'll pick and choose out of the Sermon on the Mount, which was a great sermon on how to live, and we will make even the whole focus of missions began to change. Now, it's interesting that it is important that you clothe the naked and feed the poor. That social aspect needs to be a part of our gospel. But they made that the very core and center of the gospel. Missions is about educating the world to make it a better place, clothing them, civilizing them, etc. instead of the proclamation of the cross of Jesus Christ. And when I look at the ministry of Franklin Graham, I think he's got a great balance because he goes with medicine. And he goes all over the world with food and supplies and shoeboxes and all of this. And at the same time, is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. That's the wonderful balance. The problem with the liberal mo mo movement is they became a social gospel, which is why so many churches just died. Cold, dead, because they turned away from what was the very heart of the gospel itself. Then in the mid-1900s, we saw another turn. It became all about therapy. The pulpit became the therapist's stand, trying to make people feel better about themselves and having better self-esteem, better marriages, and so on. And, and every one of us would agree that we need to have a good self-esteem, that, that we want people to have good marriages. But the problem was that the pulpit was replaced um, instead of preaching the gospel, all of the focus seemed to go on that. A long time ago, I read part of a book written by an, an African-American minister, and he says, why has the power gone out of our black churches? He was preaching from the, or teaching from the perspective, writing from the perspective of someone who grew up in a black church and had studied the history of the black church in America. He said, because they went away from preaching about Jesus and salvation and the cross of Christ and started preaching about betterment of life, being happier and more fulfilled in this life. They got away from the gospel. 
Paul goes on to say, we preach, <clears throat> we preach Christ crucified, the stumbling block to Jews, folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. He doesn't mean that God is foolish or weak. What he's saying is what people would consider foolishness in the message of God is wiser than anything a human being can ever produce and stronger than anything a human being could ever produce. He, Paul is driving this home to a culture that's very much fixed on earthly man wisdom, intellect, rhetoric, skill. And he's trying to say all of that stuff that the Greeks admire is foolishness compared to the wisdom that God has to give. And through the world's wisdom, through Greece's wisdom, you can never come to know God. He even says to them, <clears throat> I'm going to stop pretty soon, <laughs> about five minutes here. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to the, what, flesh or worldly standards. Not many of you very powerful, not many of you of noble birth. Otherwise, most of us are just plain folk, right? <laughs> we're just plain people. <laughs> it, it reminds me, if I, could, if I could just divert for just a second here about the Beverly Hillbillies, and they portrayed backwoods plain folk, right? And I can remember watching the very first two that were ever done. A woman I knew had the, a whole series of the Hillbillies, starting with their pilot show. And if you, if, if you remember watching that, the Beverly Hillbillies, you know a little bit about them. And when they saw their mansion for the very first time, Mr. Drysdale, the banker, was very proud of what he was showing them. And, he walks into the main foyer, and he looks up at this beautiful candelabra. It's beautiful. And he stops for a moment like this and admires it and said, yeah, that was one time belonged to Louis XIV. It hung in the Louvre in France. And then Jed Clampett says, Mr. Drysdale, we be plain folk. We don't care if it's secondhand. But anyway, <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. <coughs> But anyways, <laughs> Paul is saying, you know, most, most of us are just plain folk. We're just plain. But God chooses the things that are foolish by the world's standards, okay? And he chooses the things that are weak to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world's view, <clears throat> even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no, he does it for this reason, that no human being would ever be able to boast in the presence of God. Nobody would ever be able to boast in the presence of God. Not, you, you can't boast and say, God, it was my skill, my knowledge. I plumbed the depths of knowledge. And what, is, what does Solomon say after... In, in the book of Ecclesiastes, one of our other wisdom, pieces of wisdom literature in the Bible, that he had searched far and wide. He, he, he gave his life over to the searching of knowledge and wisdom, including the science as much as he could in nature itself. And he wrote all those proverbs, et cetera. But at the end, he said, this is the full, total responsibility of man, duty of man, he uses that word. And that's to fear God and obey his commandments. Fear God, obey his commandments. That's what it's all about. After all the searching I've done, and that's what Paul is trying to say. There's nothing wrong with wanting to learn. We need to. And I thank God for people who study and learn. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had cars to drive here with, right? I mean, the knowledge out there is important. The medicine that we have today, God gives different gifts to different people. But when it comes to our worship and knowledge of the Lord and the proclamation of the gospel, we need the simplicity of the gospel itself. Paul closes out the chapter by saying, after saying that no man is to boast in the presence of God. He says, and because of him, that's because of Christ, you are in Christ Jesus. Who what? Who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification 
and redemption. So that as it is written, let no, excuse me, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Otherwise, it's all about God. It's all about God. My only boast is that he saved me. And he gave me wisdom. I like the first two verses of chapter 2, and that's where I'll stop. Paul says, when I, excuse me, and I, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided, I like the word determined better, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, I was with you in weakness, Paul said, in fear and much trembling. In my speech and my message are not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Our faith rests on the power of God, not the wisdom of men. Read this over and over yourselves at home and let it sink in and, 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 and look at the heart of Paul. The heart of Paul that it's all got to be about Christ. Everything has got to be about Christ and about his power. Paul... Uh, you know, liberal scholars and so on, they'll try to make a big deal out of how Paul is the one who actually made Christianity and popularized it, that he was obviously a very skillful man and a very ambitious man. No, <laughs> he was a very weak man. One of the reasons he was persecuted so badly in God's design was that in weakness, he would preach the gospel. And he did. He said, I was with you in weakness and, um, and trembling and fear so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's where it's at. That's what we need to know. If you preach, if you're trying to be a person of eloquent wisdom and polished, a polished rhetorician, the cross will be emptied of its power, and God will not be glorified. Keep it simple. We be plain folk. Keep it simple and proclaim Jesus Christ and him crucified. For the gospel of Christ is the power of God for salvation to all who simply believe. God made it simple. He made it powerful. But it's all about Jesus Christ and his gospel message. Isn't that wonderful? Praise God. God, bless your word to us now. Strengthen us throughout the week. Keep us safe in your care. I pray that the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the wisdom of God, and the fellowship and the teaching of the Holy Spirit would be with each of us. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Well, let's sing.